uh, this gathering of indigenous people, uh, they very clearly mentioned indigenous cosmovision. It was in the context of indigenous law, but I wanted to include this slide just to notice that the use of the term cosmovision is not new. It's been used by elders for some time, especially in public gatherings to try and articulate what it is that's at the center of the communities of indigenous communities. So cosmovision, we can say, arises in the cultural expression of indigenous peoples, especially relationships with biodiversity, land, and the larger cosmos. Cosmovision then, it points towards these ecological relationships. And you know, when Robin Wall Kimmer talks in Braiding Sweetgrass of relationships that her Potawatomi people understand between humans and the world, that's cosmovision that under, underlies so much of what she's talking about in that book. And I use the term lifeways in my own teachings quite often as a substitute for the word religion. I do not erase the word religion, but I find that um, the word religion often carries a lot of baggage when you talk about indigenous peoples or cosmovision, you know, buildings, particular roles like priests or whatnot. And among indigenous peoples, religion is not separate from the secular day-to-day -day life. It's woven into it, huh? this braided life way. So cosmovision fostered by indigenous ways of life, life worlds, the way Tim Ingle speaks about the anthropologist. Embedded in cosmovision are ways of knowing, indigenous knowledge as ways of knowing. So rather than simply Western scientific modes of knowing, cosmovision brings new ways of knowing into these discussions about the nature of reality. So also traditional environmental knowledge. It, it's a, uh, th these two terms then open up the discussion to ways of listening and observing the world that uh, are quite often new in some uh, discussions within the academy. This. Uh, call then in Cosmovisions is a call for story. We have a, a need for story, we humans. I'm looking behind Ellie and I see the words tree storytelling. It, it's stories orient and ground us, don't they? Stories motivate us and inspire us. They move our hearts to action. Stories give us a sense of our place and the roles in that place. So stories are crucial for the human family. They ground us in place on huh? this sense of they've been around for a long time and older image of a storyteller. And here's an Apache storyteller, this woman very much alive. These stories as someone like the Keith, uh, the anthropologist Keith Batho makes us aware of how wisdom lives in places. And here we see this Apache woman, their storyteller. The wisdom is alive in her stories. So also stories create responsive communities. Uh, it's a dual, it's a reciprocal, a mutual act of storytelling and communities and the storyteller engaged in this mutuality. Down in your part of the world, the Puebloan and Diné or Navajo stories of emergence are very clear about the sense of emerging into a fourth or fifth world differently told by communities. These cosmovisions then describe the journey of a people in this universe, in this reality. We know Genesis stories, these are cosmovision that teach uh, worldviews and ethics. And so also I mentioned Keith Bas Basso and the, uh, his work, Wisdom uh, in the Place Naming in the Apache World. It's, his book is filled with attention to ethics. What's interesting also, cosmovisions in the West, they also have the sense of orienting us. And this, um, this adaptation of Michelangelo's uh, painting at the Sistine Chapel, here the touch or the haptic sense. And it's interesting to think that in the Western stories or cosmovisions of creation, this uh, haptic sense of touch is much diminished. There's a, a, a distinction, if not a separation that takes place in the Western ways of knowing between sensing the world and knowing the world or minding the world. So cosmovision and sense 
We find in many traditions then the, the cosmovisions where they open us to an understanding of the world in the Shinto, the indigenous traditions in Japan, uh, the, the cosmovision of Amaterasu, the sun goddess who retreats to a cave because she's deeply embarrassed by the activities of her brother, Susano, his outrageous activities. And she takes the sun away from the world. So obviously the kami or the deities want to bring the sun back on this is reminiscent of stories in the North American context also of the bringing back of the sun by Raven. But here Amaterasu is tricked out of the cave and she sees herself in a mirror that one of the kami holds up. And so the restoration of the sun in this cosmovision. Similarly in South Asia, uh, the holy festival, it's a, it's a remarkable ceremonial moment huh? when the uh, practitioners uh, in, a, in a tradition we call Hinduism, but they celebrate the love relationship, the devotional relationship between Radha and Krishna. That's the overt activity in the holy festival. We know that this festival is celebrated by Muslims. It's celebrated by Christians in the South Asian context. So it reaches across exclusive traditions, but behind this uh, story of Radha and Krishna is a very old cosmovision of the churning of the world ocean, the celebratory character of this when the devas or those beneficial spirits and the asuras or those more numinous or potentially harmful spirits, they, it's, a it's a lengthy story where they finally gather and they wrap around the pistol here to churn the elixir of immortality, which will maintain the immortality of the deities themselves. So this cosmovision and the whole sense of the ongoing character of reality. So these cosmovisions, they, they coalesce in, in many questions, but one of them certainly is not only who is the human, but where is the human? And many of these stories have a deep anthropocentric or they're human oriented in their telling. But I, I'm uh, willing to uh, raise the question that in the cosmovision of uh, indigenous peoples in all of their variety, an anthropocosmic worldview is much more central than simply an anthropocentric. So this anthropocosmic worldview there's a fourfold embodiment that I, I sense uh, we find in these cosmovisions, namely attention to the personal body. There's a, there's a, a clear understanding of individualism as we speak of it in the West too, the personal body, but the social body becomes just as important. So hyper-individualism is dimmed down in these cosmovisions of indigenous peoples. The ecological body stands forth embedded and interwoven with the social and personal body. And then finally, as I've tried to say from the very beginning, the stars and the land are connected. The cosmological body is a character of attention in the anthropocosmic ceremonials among indigenous people. How do you bring out this fourfold embodiment? I wanted to give a few examples then. And first, the Yakawana peoples. Let me come back to this slides. But first, I have a rough map here. And excuse me, it's uh, kind of rough. I, I've circled where the Yakawana people can be found. So in the box on top, you can see right below Venezuela, the Yakawana are in the Venezuelan Amazon. And they move on the Brazil side also. You notice just down below the, the Yakawana marked in yellow are uh, Yanomami peoples just to focus on Yakuwana and Yanomami for a moment. This is an area of intense settler colonialism now. This is an area of intense problem for the indigenous peoples with the movement of peoples uh, into the area who are not indigenous, roads being built. So the, uh, the settler colonialism of today is uh, preceded by the evangelical colonialism of many of the religious uh, uh, groups involved in conversion work among Yakuwana and Yanomami peoples, Catholic evangelical Christianos. So I, I wanted to 
pull out some traditional values here, just a few slides on the Yekawana. Uh, I wanted to focus on the baskets, which are at the center of their cosmovision and their roundhouse, their habitat. If we consider these uh, baskets that I've pictured here, uh, you notice immediately there's a central design and an outer design. Uh, the play I wanted to make here is the sense of microcosm, macrocosm, inner and outer. Same with the roundhouse. Inside of the roundhouse, the inner center is the ceremonial setting, shamanic healing, ritual activity. The outer center is habitat where the families house themselves. So between the baskets, which are at the center of Yekawanic cosmovision and their life way is this inner and outer and the design element. So this sense of uh, the basket on uh, my right, the larger full basket is, um, it's actually a snake design. So if you can think for a moment, if food is placed on the basket and a Yekawana person then as they are eating, the design expresses itself then to them. On the, my right is the, uh, a bat design with this, these two chevrons joined together. These chevrons are the shoulders of the culture hero, Wanadi. So underlying, basket making in the Yekawana world is the cosmovision of the culture hero Wanadi. It's a major and lengthy story, but uh, one point uh, to draw out is Wanadi gives rise to his double, Odosha. And when Wanadi uh, gives, gives birth to Wanosha, he inappropriately fails to bury the placenta and this leads then to the, the duality of Odosha being problematic. Odosha thrives in the world. And so Wanadi has a transcendent or a transcendental character. He visits reality. Odosha is embedded in reality. Basket making then involves the preparation of materials and the gathering. These are in the world of Odosha. So the, the, the design and story, which is uh, an effort implemented into the braiding of the baskets, this design and story brings the use of the basket to the larger cultural cosmovision of how the world has to be harmonized. So the weaving of a basket is itself a cosmological act in which cosmovision is brought to bear upon the gathering of materials, the design that's put in it, and how this is involved in the day-to-day -day life, the life wave of people. So the Yakawana and cosmovision, just a, a brief overview. Uh, I wanted to uh, make a, a parallel with the, the roundhouse that the sense of inner and outer then the inner design of the roundhouse for ritual activity and the outer for habitat also completes this sense of the, the cosmovision and the duality that doubles in the world that have to be harmonized with one another in a Yekawana perspective. So these ecological modalities woven into the life way. Another example that I wanted to draw out uh, a bit more at length is uh, among the Crow people who I've visited with since 1980. Uh, uh, among the Crow, about 9,000 uh, uh, Crow members, uh, 7,000 on reservation and um, other Crows living around the world. Uh, the Crow have uh, dialectical differences among this small group. Their name for themselves, Apsaloke or Aps Apsaroke, a people of the mythic bird. And in their uh, tribal emblem, you can see parts of their cosmovision, the sense of the cosmos in the sun and the radiant stars, the mountains and the rivers flowing out, also suggestive of the horns of a buffalo, the teepee and their home, their habitat, huh? echoing the roundhouse among the Yakawana, sense of the uh, pipe at the bottom and the headdress, the eagle feathers honoring warriors. The moccasin that I've pictured on uh, uh, my left, uh, I just wanted to draw out the cosmovision embedded in geometric symbols. Huh? So the crow 
telling their story of their coming from the stars, especially Venus, changing grandmother, that they tell the story in these geometric patterns in their moccasins. The crow are located in a reservation in Montana, and uh, I've put yellow around the reservation, but I've uh, inadvertently also included the Northern Cheyenne by Busby. And so you can see that the distinction in the Crow Indian Reservation is, is uh, uh, named, but the Northern Cheyenne next to it, it's a lovely reservation, well watered, and the Crow uh, have lost significant parts of their reservation to settler colonialism, and they have now begun to recover much more of their reservation. The sense of uh, the Crow as a people who moved from my home uh, area in what is now North Dakota, the Crow probably moved in 1400 or so, went on a long journey when they uh, separated from the Hidatsa people who remained in that High Plains region of what we now call North Dakota. And the Crow moved on a, a long journey until they finally came to the place where a vision of the four-starred, five-starred uh, tobacco plant came to them and they settled in Montana. I wanted to include this painting by George Catlin from the 1830s to indicate the traditional environmental knowledge uh, of the Crow people, a cosmovision based on their relationship with the Crow. And coming from that country, I'm aware of how desolate can, it can be in some treeless areas. And so we see Crow uh, hunters here who are bringing to bear their knowledge of the buffalo in a ceremonial where they will go to hunt the buffalo. So a cosmovision embedded in the ceremonial. This ceremonial, of course, when the horse came, became uh, later, we'd be romanticized in images such as this by Remington, but he captures both the thrill and the danger of the buffalo hunt. So buffalo at the center of the Crow Cosmovision. And this uh, is also evident in a very interesting statement by a young Crow warrior named Woha in a clearer uh, version here. Woha was uh, arrested and imprisoned in the uh, late 70s, 80, 1880s, when he joined a, a rebellious group, a, a, a young crow by the name of Wraps Up His Tail, when the crow were uh, coerced onto a reservation and they were forbidden their older practices of raiding for warrior honors and to gain eagle feather honors and uh, wraps up his tail, led a group of warriors against the Blackfeet and came back. And in their celebration, they were shooting at the agency and the cavalry was brought in and several Crow were killed and several were imprisoned, one of whom was Woha. And during those that time of imprisonment, Woha was given uh, as many uh, native uh, prisoners that, these ledger books and uh, colored pencils or other objects. And Woha here pictures himself in a moment of transition. If I could use again the story language, Woha is between stories. He is acknowledging through the pipe his relationship with the breath of the buffalo, the nurturing buffalo. And if you notice in the sky, the cosmovision of the sun and the relationship of the sun and the stars and the moon. So the cosmovision here that Woha is drawing on the habitat and the sweat lodge uh, fire at his feet. And he is acknowledging that there is a new story that's come to his people's land. And Woha is considering he's keeping the pipe, his life way, but he's acknowledging cattle and its new way of nurturance. And he's thinking habitat in the home. So it's a very interesting moment where a crow warrior was in, involved in cosmovision reflection and this sense of our times now, how we also are in between stories. And we also know cosmovision that uh, have endured even as we have changed. And so we wonder in our own times about where do we humans belong? And 
when I've been on the Crow Reservation since 1980, uh, my exchange has been with the medicine horse and birding ground families. And these are, uh, this is a couple who adopted Mary Evelyn and myself into their family. So Violet Medicine Horse and Adam Burden Ground are our Crow parents. And in the early 80s, I was with Adam and Violet one day and Violet said, let's have a picture because you're a teacher. You'll need a picture to talk about us when you uh, wanna talk about Crow Lifeways. So we went outside and Adam said, let's uh, put on our peyote way regalia. And so this picture is so meaningful to me because it shows how braided in the Crow way, the traditional life way, Adam and Violet and the Medicine Horse and Birding Around family, these are traditional Crow families. By that, I mean Sundance, Vision Quest, Medicine Bundles, these are important to these families, but also the Native American church. And this is how they presented themselves in this picture. Adam was a roadman. He was a roadman in the Native American church and Violet was a water woman. They have both, as the Crow say, gone to the other side camp. They passed on, but they are with me. They're part of the ancestors that speak to me about these cosmovisions that are embedded in their inclusive understanding of their way of life, not an exclusive, huh? They're also member, they were members of the uh, local Baptist church. So the sense then of a people who have uh, a relationship with the world around them that's embedded in particular ceremonials. And one that I have had the occasion to study over the years is a ceremony called Ashkise Lisua. Ashkise in Crow means this cosmic lodge that's built or a big lodge. And Lisua is dancing. So dancers, men and women go into this lodge which is constructed and this is a cosmovision construction because the 12 outer poles are the clans and the, the peoples of the crow and the rafters then relate them to this unific understanding of a story that gathers them together. And you notice on the central tree is the buffalo again, this nurturing presence and the, the uh, eagle, a stuffed eagle is in the upper branches. And so this ceremonial is a way of bringing to the, uh, the local region a renewal of the land, a renewal of the diversity and a renewal of the people. So when the lodge is finished, the shade trees are put on the outside. So these dancers who go into this lodge and fast from food and water for three, four or five days, they have some shade that they can retreat to and all day long, they're dancing to this central tree. And this uh, Ashkise Liswa or Sundance as they say in English is a ceremony of turning the wheel of the universe. And in this ceremonial then, as the family uh, that uh, uh, by adoption introduced me to this ceremonial so that I have participated in this Ashkise Liswa and they took pictures that I might have photos for my teaching. This is where blessing and healing takes place. So the cosmovision brings forward the capacity of the medicines of the people to meet the needs of the people and the deep sensing in this ceremonial and the ways in which the intellectual ideas are discussed among those who are dancing in this place, in this lodge, and the relationships that are established. This is what Cosmovision has um, mis continues to mean for Crow people. Uh, a final example in this uh, segment is uh, the indigenous environmental activism of Lummi and Nuchal Nuth, Nuth peoples on the Northwest coast of North America. This is related to the uh, blockade of the building of coal uh, uh, shipping terminals by bringing traditional lineage poles or totem poles to bear on the resistance of these First Nations peoples to the buildings of these terminals. So master carver, Jewel James came up with the idea of carving 
a, a new lineage pole that would reflect the presence of Mother Earth. So to the right here, the whole imaging of Mother Earth. And initially, they wanted to have the human, the child, held by Mother Earth. But because this totem pole would be carried around the country, initially, it was to resist the uh, the plan of uh, coal shipping terminals on the northwest coast, and that was successful. So they began to carry this lineage pole to other sites of resistance, initially Standing Rock and uh, uh, the uh, line, line 3 pipeline in Minnesota. This uh, was altered in its uh, original uh, carving, where the youth was then moved from the held in Mother Earth's hands into the womb. So the uh, symbolic cosmovision that's embedded in this uh, totem pole, and it is now brought to bear in environmental protection among indigenous peoples. So this has been repeated with other lineage poles. It was uh, such a, a successful act of cosmopolitics, if I can use that term, the sense then of a, uh, a activity in which indigenous voice becomes very clear in speaking out of their cosmo, cosmovision to political concerns that they have. And so from the standpoint of their cosmovision to bring uh, their uh, perspective into these environmental issues where they want to be informed and have prior understanding and have their voice recognized as integral to these projects. So cosmovision and cosmopolitics now being brought to ecological concerns. Standing Rock is a very good example of cosmopolitics where this largest gathering of indigenous peoples in the modern period was brought to defend the sacred in the face of policing, what brought uh, uh, private policing agencies brought and the nonviolent activities of these in, uh, indigenous uh, peoples were met with aggressive uh, actions. And we, we see in the language used by the Hunk Papa especially, recognizing water as the first medicine, this kinship with the natural world and the whole effort is to enter into protection of these relationships. So also the Enbridge pipeline, uh, these are important activities now of protection. And the, they uh, join together, they're in alliance with international movements. Uh, we know in 2007, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples at the United Nations, the sense of prior and informed consent, recognizing the cosmovision of indigenous peoples and their right to bring it to bear to their political concern. So I wanted to make a, a turn now towards a project that uh, we have been engaged here, uh, namely my wife, Mary Evelyn Tucker and uh, Brian Swim in the Journey of the Universe project, where we now begin to be aware of this evolutionary story that we have come out of a larger universe of 13.8 billion years of development and the beauty of the universe that surrounds us even as we become aware of the extinction questions that we face and the destructive dimension. So this journey of the universe project is trying to rethink evolution. It's not simply random, but the chaos and creativity have their own integral directions, not simply purposeless, but revisiting the whole idea of uh, short-term teleology, short-term purpose, and not meaningless, but a sense of shared meaning across ethnic divides and across cosmovisions. So we now realize there are multiple ways of knowing, multiple ways of telling these stories. And that we now sense that the stars that indigenous peoples have understood as linked to their land, that these stars are the process from which the reality that gave birth to the solar systems and the earth on which we live and the processes of the volcanic processes that shape this earth and have given us this incredible tectonic process and the movements of life from out of water in 
onto the land and uh, through the forms of biodiversity that we humans are familiar with, this incredible beauty that has shaped us and shaped our minds, that we now recognize human diversity and we move to understand that biodiversity and human diversity are an integral ecological understanding. So this Journey of the Universe project draws on indigenous perspectives understanding the indigenous relationship to land and the voice of indigenous people saying, we have belonged here, all of our understanding, we have always belonged here. That this is now a, a, a new understanding that is part of the stories that come to us. And we have these competing stories in our own time, huh? the sense of nationalism and white supremacism that we see in the United States today in relationship to the internationalism that we reach towards a, uh, an understanding of materialism and the well-being that we seek as search for as communities, the militarism that we experience and uh, we oppose it with nonviolence and racism, sexism and classism with a, a call towards inclusivity, these competing stories are uh, calling us away from simply the hyper-individualism of the West towards a larger understanding of earth communities and the separation to uh, a sense of larger holism. If we are humans then in search of shared stories, we're also aware of our individual stories and these the sense of competing nation states and their stories, we begin to feel movement towards multicultural the many stories form part of the, our planetary emergence. So we have a movement from a declaration of independence to a declaration of the rights of indigenous people and towards a declaration of interdependence. So the journey of the universe film in this project is drawing on indigenous perspectives to talk about a living earth community, the sense of kinship of life forms and a relational knowing that is so strong in indigenous cosmovisions, being in relationship. And it opens up the question again of shared goals, responding, where do we come from? It's a evolutionary context is one telling and indigenous cosmovisions stand in their own right to tell this story of why we are here, where we are going. And that we realize that humans can become a mutually enhancing presence for the earth community. This is our shared goal in the sense of uh, our awareness now of our relatedness to the cosmos and the earth. We realize that out of the supernovas that the material reality, the elemental reality has shaped us and indeed the stars are our ancestors. And that interdependence has been in, in, uh, told in the cosmovisions of indigenous peoples and the care for the flourishing in people of people and planet, just as the Ashkese Liswar, that Sundance has at its center, that renewal or care. We're trying to recover it, trying to recover a sense of the interdependence of life that, in which we are braided. And so the earth and the whole Gaia understanding of the earth as a living reality, that this is re in relationship to the understanding of the stars that we come from, the explosive capacity of supernovas. I had occasion to hear a, uh, an astronaut, Chris Hadfield, and he, um, he speaks quite widely and he uses this phrase to talk about a new understanding that he came to. And he, he was walking in space and he looked at the earth in space and he saw this power of the presence of the world. And it was talking to him, this sense that it was told to him, the power of the presence of the world as told to me. And then he moved in this way by my ability to see it. And I, I was um, very uh, uh, drawn to this statement that he was making. And so I, I put it on a, a sheet of paper and you can see where I wrote the power of the presence of the world as told to me. And then as Chris Hadfield, I wrote by my ability to see it. 
And initially then I thought, well, it's not an it. It's, it's, it's got its own pronouns, reality. It's, it's them, they, he, or her, him, it. Uh, then I realized it was more than just a change of pronouns. It was not simply my ability to see it, but the power of the presence of the world as told to me by the world's ability to speak to us. And I think that's what indigenous cosmovisions have given us this new understanding of the world speaking to us. There is no doubt that one of the most powerful stories, the cosmopolitics around bears ears today, it is telling us how the world is speaking to us and the alliance, the historic Bears Ears intertribal coalition that led to this monument being named during the Obama era and then how it was collapsed in the last administration and now restored, that this is a site, it's a place of all of this call for protection and for resistance, that this is a cosmovision and cosmopolitics it working itself out in our times. It's another example of indigenous cosmovisions and the politics that results from them coming to our ecological concern. So with that, let me say miigwech in the Anishinaabe perspective, aho from the Northern Plains, limlim in the Salish of the Northwest Coast and Northwest Interior, uh, and thank all of you for uh, your attention uh, during these remarks. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, John, for your uh, amazing slideshow and presentation. I want to open it up now to anyone that has questions. I also want to just say that as scientists, we often get really focused on our intellectual findings. And so I feel like this talk really helps us see a broader um, relationship with all those around us and what we need to really incorporate to um, be more fully alive and help our findings get out there in the world. So um, if you want, you can put a question in the chat or you can raise your hand. Uh, if we don't have a a lot of people all at once, then you can also just unmute yourself and ask your question. Otherwise, if you put it in, I will, um, I will articulate it for John. Uh, I've got a question for you, John. So I, I really enjoyed that the progression going from like, the cosmic imagination all the way up through some of the more recent ones like the human diversity paintings. Um, I don't know if they were watercolor or something like that. Were those uh, paintings something that you had, you know, experienced or like done as, as a part of your work or were those just images you had pulled from that? If I was wondering if there was any uh, origin to, to some of the imagery that you used. Uh, thanks, Scott. I, I appreciate your bringing us back. Those are uh, watercolors and some watercolor and acrylic that I've done. I, I've uh, I've begun to uh, try to tell some of the stories of the field work that I've engaged with, and uh, in telling these stories, I want to illustrate them. And so I've uh, drawn these uh, as illustrating uh, the stories that I'm telling. And I'm I have uh, uh, six themes that I'm working with: uh, the sense of um, a father, mother, uh, sound, uh, friend, uh, son, S-U-N, and teacher and mentor. So I have these thematic agendas that I'm telling stories and I want to illustrate them. Uh, Scott, I uh, just to make a further comment and linking back to what Ellie was saying, I, I'm very keen on the relationship of sensing, of our, our capacity to see color and to the synesthesia of smelling color uh, and sensing related to our mind, our intellectual activity. I find in indigenous traditions, those connections are made and from them results creativity. 
So sensing, minding, and creating have become shorthand for me for the act of the universe emergence. I think sensing, minding, and creating have been in this universe from the beginning. Yeah, I found it very interesting. I had never looked at the that Michelangelo classic in the way that you described it with like almost this detachment from that haptic element. It was a really, really interesting turn of the, not turn of phrase, but turn of painting. Uh -huh. Thanks, Scott. Hi, John, I have a question. Um, hey, Samuel. I was extremely interested in your story, how you said that you were adopted into the family um, yeah. in the 1980s. So could you speak a little more about how that connection came about? Yeah. Part of your work with the university or a personal connection? Thanks, Samuel. I, I appreciate that very much because adoption in, uh, is so close to exploitation in my way of thinking. It's a uh, the the when I went to work, especially among Anishinaabe peoples, quite often I was greeted with the phrase, uh, you know, we First Nations, we have lost so much. And now those of you are coming among us to take our religion. It's the last thing we have and you want to take our religion. So th these conversations sensitized me very early to these issues of exploitation. So when uh, Violet Medicine Horse, when she first uh, mentioned the whole idea of adoption, I did not say anything to her, but I've, I felt myself drawing back. And I had come to study the Sundance ceremonial and I had attended it for five years. And uh, the first time I attended, uh, Violet and Adam and the Burdum Ground Medicine Horse families were there. And they said, next year when you come, do not come to the dance grounds alone. I had an introduction to Thomas Yellowtail, the leader of that Sundance, but they said, don't come alone. It looks strange because families come. So uh, I uh, went with the Burdum Ground family over the next uh, years to the ceremonial and it naturally led to adoption. But Samuel, what I did not understand was that for the crow, adoption is a, a manner in which the, these people recognize the need for mentoring. So if I'm a young person and I wanna undertake a, a, a vision quest, and I want to go to uh, an elder to help me undertake, and the crow have a particular way of walking through the mountains to take a, undertake a vision quest, it would be appropriate for me to go to that elder and the elder to adopt me. So the crow have seen adoption as a way of understanding their cosmovisions. And by using Cosmovision, I want to use it in plural for the Crow too. It's not just one story. It's not just one ceremonial. It's a variety. There's a multiplicity. And adoption then into the Crow family, into the birding ground and medicine horn family. By no means was that adoption into the Crow people. By no means. That was an adoption into a family and kinship and care and love of a family, but also undercurrents of opening the door to my participating in the Ashkese Liswa. So through dreams, I actually began then to dance in, the, in that ceremonial. And I've danced 10 times with uh, my family in that ceremonial. So it becomes a very complex idea. And it's gone through a lot of changes in my own understanding of it. Can I ask you uh, what brought you to the question? Or... Well, I've been, um, so my, my dad has a couple different children with different uh, mothers and one of them is from the Pomo tribe in California. And so I've always been raised with a respect for Native American cultures, but always thought um, 
kind of like you said, like it's not our culture to take. It's it's one thing to be invited in, but it's not our culture to take. And so I found your your story and your work really interesting because I think there's a really growing interest <clears throat> in indigenous cultures and traditional ecological knowledge. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to make that, um, to bridge that gap sometimes between, you know, Western white scientific knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge, because who, um, you know, who, who starts that connection and then how does it go? And it's obviously different for everybody, but I think your story was really interesting and inspiring. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Samuel. That's, uh, I'm glad we're recording it because that's a, a beautiful explication from your standpoint of these issues. I, I think the only way, well, no, I'm not the only, one of the ways we need to undertake in order to come to a, 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 a of the possibility of an exchange with First Nations, with indigenous people that has meaning is to tell our story. The story of exploitation, of oppression, of marginalization, of boarding schools, and it is being told. And then to sit silently and listen to uh, native peoples tell their side of that same story. I completely agree. One of the, uh, and don't let me talk over anyone who wants a question too. Uh, we have a website, the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. I, I want to invite everyone into that website. It's very rich. It's F-O-R-E, Forum on Religion and Ecology, F-O-R-E dot Yale dot edu. And uh, there is a section there on uh, living cosmologies and living earth community. The Living Earth community has some really fine articles and interviews with a group. It was a small conference where we were gathering, thinking about these ideas of Cosmovision. So I want to uh, just uh, make a mention of that on the website. It might be a good resource for those of you listening. I should have talked more, Ellie. I I, uh, I could be windier and. Uh. <laughs> well, I'll ask a question. And I also want to say if anybody else has a question right now, just break in because I'll have an opportunity to listen and ask later. Uh, I was real curious with the um, story where you, the Waha, the drawing that you had up where he was listening. Oh, he was in, yes. yes, thank you. In between stories. I thought that was a really interesting way to um, look at like change. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that? The, what a fine question. The, the, it's liminal space, isn't it? I, I think some of these ritual specialists, when they use the word liminal with regard to rituals, and they talk about ritual space as in between space. In other words, you've come out of a community and you go into a space in which there are rather extraordinary experiences. They, they may be even altered, uh, alter one's consciousness. And then you return to the community. Uh, this sense of, of uh, stories um, among a people, I, I found, you know, when I began my studies in the 1960s, I could literally write a dissertation on Native American peoples and never visit or know a Native person. It could be completely textual. At a major university, I studied my PhD at Fordham with Thomas Berry. Coming from North Dakota, I had learned nothing about Native people in my high school education. My, my family, I had met through berry picking. I had met Native people, but I had no idea of the depth of thought when I studied with Thomas Berry, I returned and Thomas Berry was one who really began to give me a, a sense that these are traditions that have their place at the table of the dialogue of the religions of the world, but it's denied to them. And I, I sense what, what I came to was my own liminal understanding. I, I, I began to realize that there are powerful understandings 
that we need to bring to the community, the earth community. We need to bring it as a larger dominant society to our understanding. So Ellie, thanks a, a lot for the, this question about being in between stories as a way of understanding transformation that the stories are not canceled in that regard. They, they uh, affect one another, they transform one another. I'm thinking of, a, of the vision quest of a young person who goes on a vision quest and they have an experience in that place in the natural world that they're woven into and they return to the community and they tell an elder and an elder then calls the community and will tell an appropriate uh, narration of what this young person has experienced. When I reflect upon a vision quest in that remark, I think about the, the characterizing of indigenous peoples as traditional. You know, that frozen image, they're frozen in their story, but in fact, they're always between stories. That young person is always bringing something new. There's a creative tension going on. And so these ind indigeneity, we may see it as something modern and new, but I see it as very old. It's the recovery of the voice of a people in the next generation speaking to the, to the elders. And so now uh, the sense of the liminal or in between is a, a challenge that uh, our whole society faces in this climate change environmental issues. Huh? Thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions in the chat that have come in. I'll read the first one that is from James Allen. Thank you for this presentation, Dr. Graham. I'm wondering if you are aware of a specific example of how efforts on the part of the public land managers to understand and appreciate the Cosmo vision of indigenous people have led to concrete changes in management. If you have an example related to a national forest, that would be great. Yeah, that's, that's a terrific question. And uh, I, I'm immediately, uh, I'm calling on the resources of those around us. The National Park Service now has uh, numbers of indigenous rangers. And not only the indigenous rangers, but other park rangers have begun to place markers in national parks, calling attention to the stories. So I find in the, uh, in the sequoias, in the California uh, Redwood Sequoia National uh, uh, Park, if I'm remembering correctly, there are now uh, native uh, narrations along with the signage. Uh, let me just uh, give another example, which I found recently in New York City, uh, in the Metropolitan Museum. There uh, is a new space in the Metropolitan Museum dedicated to uh, American Indian art. And when I, I first went to that exhibition, Ned Blackhawk, who is a historian here at Yale, had played a role. And so I was especially aware and thinking about the role that Ned had, uh, Blackhawk, and students at Yale had played in that exhibit. And I walked out of the exhibition and there was a, a, a dramatic a romantic imaging of an American Indian that a white alabaster feathered statue and the signage of this um, representation of an Ab Anishinaabe warrior based on Longfellow's poem, Hiawatha. And next to the signage of the Metropolitan Museum was the signage of a native curators uh, from the exhibition. And it was a remarkable moment of, in my uh, experience where Cosmovision had entered into the understanding of an institution of itself where they were presenting a highly romanticized image, exploitative of uh, American Indian peoples and they hadn't re erased the old signage, but they had now placed native narration. And it was, it was charged with uh, the, the, the language of exploitation in this image. So 
I, I think it's really interesting to see where this is happening now in the native Hawaiian telling of the voyages of Hokulea and the, um, the uh, solar paneling on the, the, this, uh, these craft that are engaged in trans-oceanic voyages so that the school children in Hawaii can participate in the native Hawaiian uh, uh, using traditional navigation techniques to sail literally across the Pacific Ocean. They have now taken, taken it in trans-oceanic, transplanetary. But uh, the school children in Hawaii have followed. And so the, uh, the, the uh, foregrounding and honoring of the cosmovisions of native Hawaiian people in this very contemporary example of the movement of a transoceanic voyage. There's some really powerful uh, uh, examples. And thanks so much for this question, James. It's a very fine question. Okay, well, we've gotten to 501. Carol, I'm sorry, we're not gonna get to your question, but if you want to, anyone and everyone, if you want to join us in the discussion afterwards, we're gonna give um, Dr. Graham just a moment of recovery, and then we'll start the discussion for the class at 505. Uh, Gia has put in there the link for you to be able to join us. And we um, want to just give you one more final round of appreciation. Thank you so much for your um, talk today. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Ellie, I'll just stay here. I'll, uh, I'll mute.